All right, so glad to see you this morning as we are continuing our study through the book of Micah. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn with me over to chapter 5. Today, uh, as we have uh, been in the past looking at Micah by chapters, Today, we're going to look at just the first four verses. There's a lot of information here, and I want us to pay particularly close attention uh, because of the cross-references that we're going to be covering uh, as supplement information to the first four verses, particularly Micah chapter 5, verse 2. I've entitled today's message, The King's Birthplace. Now, by the king's birthplace, I'm not referring to Tupelo, Mississippi. What we're referring to is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, I've taken these four verses and basically put them under the heading of a three-point outline with the first, which we'll see in verse 1 being a warning about Judah's captivity. Uh, You'll recall Micah is predominantly writing to the people of Judah, that is the southern kingdom, which will eventually be taken captive in 586 B.C. with Jerusalem and the temple being destroyed. Uh, Micah at this time is writing at somewhere around 7, between 750 and 701 B.C. And so he's talking about something that ultimately is not going to be happening uh, for about 130 years in reference to the Babylonians coming to sack the city of Jerusalem and take Judah captive. But he's warning about that now. So we see that in verse 1. Verse 2 concerns the whereabouts of Jesus' coming. Though Jesus is not mentioned specifically in the verse, he is talking about a future ruler that through God's progressive revelation we later find out to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll see in verses 3 and 4 that Micah gives us a word about justice commenced. That is, what it will be like in that kingdom era when the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. So let's begin by looking at uh, verse 1 in reference to Micah speaking and warning about Judah's captivity. And basically what he says is that Judah will be taken captive. We see this all the way back in Micah chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. He tells them uh, who is going to be taking them captive. He says in verse 9 of chapter 4, Now why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you? Or has your counselor perished? That agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth. He was using very vivid language here. Wreath in labor to give birth, daughter of Zion, like a woman in childbirth. For now you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, and go to Babylon. Again, this is unique because at this particular time, the Assyrian nation is the one who is the greater threat. They have not yet taken the ten northern tribes captive, but they will. But yet Micah is looking forward even past the Assyrian empire to the Babylonian Empire. And what he says is that Judah will be surrounded. Look at the first part of Micah chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. Now, the, the word muster here is gadad in the Hebrew, and it means to uh, inflict cuts on oneself or to put gashes on oneself. Uh, But it can also mean to to get together or to band together. Many commentators have questioned why does Micah tell the people to do this? Particularly when it was something that was against the law of God. Uh, One commentator notes, quote, Micah sarcastically calls upon Zion to engage in heathen mourning rites that involved cutting oneself, which the law forbade. Or Micah is ordering Zion to form itself into a troop. He says this interpretation is preferable. That is the one about gathering yourselves to gather in a, in a form of a troop or troop formation. As in Micah 4.9 where the figure of sarcasm was also disallowed. It better fits the oracle of salvation. And so what he's basically saying is get ready because you're about to be surrounded. 
Moreover, not only will you be surrounded, but you're going to be subjugated. You're going to be taken captive. Look at the latter part of verse uh, 1. He says, with a rod, they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. Again, the question has to be asked as we are looking at this. Remember who, what, when, where, why, and how. That's kind of the grid we come to the text with in terms of answering the questions that these verses bring out. And so the question among commentators is who in the verse is the judge of Israel? Who in context are we speaking of? Uh, One, some would hold that it is the Lord Jesus Christ. That it's something that happened during precursor to his crucifixion in A.D. 33. Uh, Yet there are other scholars who would hold that, no, what Micah is referring to is King Zedekiah, uh, who would be the last king of Judah. You'll recall by looking at the chart here, um, Micah is prophesying, that is, he's conducting his ministry around the time of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Zedekiah will become the last king of Judah before being taken away into captivity. And so there there are evidences actually for and or against uh, both of these individuals being the point of what Micah is writing about. Well, uh, some evidence would suggest that it is in fact the Lord who is in reference to the context. Why? Because Jesus was struck on the face and head. The gospel writers make this clear. Uh, Jesus is definitely the subject of the next verse, which is Micah chapter 5, verse 2, uh, being born in Bethlehem. Uh, And yet some would say, no, it's not Jesus. It's actually Zedekiah, the last king. Why? Because the Babylonian siege is the context of the verse if we are following the train of thought from the previous chapter. That hasn't changed. Uh, Also, Jesus is definitely the subject of the next verse, being born in Bethlehem. So one of the evidences used for Jesus being the context of the referent in the verse is also for, uh, or could be used to support Zedekiah being the king. Uh, Moreover, Christ was not killed by troops while Jerusalem was besieged. However, Nebuchadnezzar did capture Zedekiah and torture him by killing his sons and putting his eyes out. Uh, That's why MacArthur notes in reference to this, he says the rod that smikes his cheek is the instrument used to put his eyes out. And the story is recorded for us over in 2 Kings chapter 25 uh, in reference to Zedekiah when Uh, Jeremiah writes, So on January 15th, during the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon led his entire army against Jerusalem. They surrounded the city and built siege ramps against its walls. Jerusalem was kept under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah's reign. And by July 18th, in the eleventh year of Zedekiah's reign, the famine in the city had become very severe and the last of the food was entirely gone. Then a section of the city wall was broken down. And since the city was surrounded by the Babylonians, the soldiers waited for nightfall and escaped through the gate between the two walls behind the king's garden. Then they headed toward the Jordan Valley. But the Babylonian troops chased the king and overtook him on the plains of Jericho, for his men had all deserted him and scattered. They captured the king and took him to the king of Babylon at Riblah, where they pronounced judgment on Zedekiah. Watch this. They made Zedekiah watch as they slaughtered his sons, the princes of Judah. And then they gouged out Zedekiah's eyes, bound him in bronze chains, and led him away to Babylon, where he would ultimately die in captivity. And so we can see then that there are very graphic images and descriptions of the king, that is the leader of Israel, being struck Uh, And so, you know, there are those who could say, well, it it could be speaking of Zedekiah in terms of the near fulfillment, and yet could also be speaking of Christ in reference to the far fulfillment. And I think whatever which one you would hold, whether you see both Jesus and Zedekiah in the passage, or just Zedekiah, or just the Lord, uh, Henry Morris in His commentary notes this, he said, Smiting an official on the cheek was considered a bitter insult. 
And the ultimate insult was uh, representatives of a godless pagan government to strike the true judge of Israel and of all the earth on the cheek as they did repeatedly during the mock trial of Christ. The entire context here is messianic, involving aspects of both comings of Messiah. It goes well beyond any public humiliation of King Zedekiah by the Babylonians as many have interpreted it. So it's... it's not uncommon to see this as a both a near and far fulfillment. In other words, in the context, you could say, yes, the immediate context is King Zedekiah. However, a future fulfillment would also be seen in the uh, persecution of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, during uh, as a precursor of his uh, crucifixion. So let's look at verse 2, because now he's going to specifically state the whereabouts of Jesus' coming. That is, that Israel's ruler will come forth from Bethlehem. Look at verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. So what what Micah is doing here is, is he's talking about both a place and then makes a pronouncement. Look at the place He's, he mentions, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Uh, the, uh, John Martin, who writes the commentary for Micah, or on Micah, notes this. He said, the ruler, uh, Christ that is, will be born in Bethlehem Ephrathah, about five miles from Jerusalem. Ephrathah, also called Ephrath, was an older name for Bethlehem, or the name of an area around Bethlehem. David was born in Bethlehem, as was his greatest descendant, Jesus Christ. Now, why is that significant? Why is the location of Bethlehem Ephrathah significant? Well, if we consider Luke chapter 2 in reference to the birth of Christ himself, and uh, notice what Luke adds in reference to his birth narrative of the Lord Jesus Christ. He writes this, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Corinus was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, some translations will say, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now notice what what he adds here. In the same region... In the same region as what? Everything that he's talking about in terms of where Mary was and what, they had, what had just occurred, the birth of Christ. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Then they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, which is Bethlehem, uh, those shepherds are Jewish. They would have understood what the reference for the city of David being Bethlehem. He says, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. So now he tells them, this is, you're going to see a sign. Well, what's the sign? He says, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes or clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began by saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph. How did they know that? The angel didn't tell them where to go. He just said, go to the city. But they went straight there to Mary and Joseph. That's key to the entire birth narrative. And and the baby as he lay in a manger. 
When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back glorified and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as it had been told. So how did the shepherds know exactly where to find Christ? Uh, Dr. Mark Bailey, in his presentation that he gave us at the uh, pre-trib study group, um, notes this. He said, how can the Messiah be associated with both Bethlehem and Jerusalem? Uh, he notes this. Ironically, both Micah 5.2, which is the verse we're looking at, and Luke 2.11 do exactly that. In other words, both link the birthplace of the Messiah and the Messianic reign together. Micah 5.2, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. And then Luke 2.11, for today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now notice these parallels. Both Bethlehem and Jerusalem were called the city of David. Why? David was born in Bethlehem, but he ruled in Jerusalem. Uh, both Bethlehem and Jerusalem are identified as Migdal Eder, or the Tower of the Flock. Jesus was born as King of the Jews in Bethlehem and will return from heaven to rule from Jerusalem, that is, the throne of David. And so, what we find in it, looking at a satellite map, the city of Bethlehem is here where Jesus was born. Bethlehem Ephrathah is about a mile just north of Bethlehem, and both of those are south of Jerusalem. Migdal Eder means watchtower of the flock. Migdal in Hebrew, the tower, uh, Eder means flock. So, uh, watchtower of the flock. It is identified in two Old Testament passages. One is from the book of Micah, the other is from the book of Genesis. The first time we see it is in the book of Genesis. Uh, so Rachel uh, died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem, and Jacob set up a pillar over her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder, the tower of the flock. And then over in Micah 4.8, Micah predicts again, has a prediction in reference to the future Messiah. He says, And you, O tower of the flock, or you, Migdal Eater, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, if you're a Jewish person hearing that, this former dominion and glory, to Joe Jew, who's living at the time of Micah, they're thinking about the golden age of Israel's rule. In other words, they're thinking about the time when David was king over Jerusalem. And what he's saying is, the way it was in the past is the way it will be in the future with even a king greater than David. Bailey again notes, what I find very significant is that according to the Mishnah, which is a book of Jewish law, oral tradition, during the second temple period, flocks were only to be kept in the wilderness because of the obvious negative effects on agriculture. The region around Jerusalem, as far out as Migdal Eder, was an exception in order to accommodate the need for a sacrificial animal to be sacrificed in the temple. Sheep or goats of one year or more within this area were assumed to be for temple service. So what he's talking about here is around Bethlehem, about a mile outside at Ephrathah, was the tower of the flock or Migdal Eder. Uh, and that what he's also adding is that from these extra biblical sources, that lambs that were uh, born and raised and cared for, which would ultimately find their way to be slaughtered, for the sins of the people. In other words, they were used for uh, religious purposes in terms of the sacrificial system. And that's where these sheep, these lambs, came from. And so Eusebius, as well as other early Christian sources, identify the tower of the flock, or Migdal Eder, with the shepherd's field, one and one-half miles east of Bethlehem, 
uh, Jerome, uh, who was a 4th century resident of Bethlehem, so he's living around there around 300 A.D., affirms the traditional identification and function of Migdal Eder and locates it by the road about one mile from Bethlehem. So why is this important? Well, we see that in the second part of verse 2. Because the area of Migdal Eder may have been the birthplace of Jesus, the Messiah. Notice what he says. Yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. You say, well, how do we know that to be the case? Or why would, why would we speculate like that? Well, let's, let's think back about what happened in the other gospel, the gospel of Matthew. Uh, in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Matthew notes that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now the question normally comes up, which is, okay, here you have these men from the east. Again, if you're Joju living in uh, Palestine or Judea at the time, uh, everything east to you would be what? Would be Babylon. I mean, you have the desert, but then everything east of that is going to be Babylon. Remember the Jews were in Babylon, right? They were in captivity for 70 years. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is praying to God, asking God for information in reference to what's going to happen in Israel's future. And ultimately what he says is he gives a couple of prophecies in reference to the city being rebuilt and restored, and then the Messiah coming and being cut off. And roughly... If you look at the number of days that are allotted for in Daniel chapter 9, it comes out to about 183,000 and something, something, something days. So, if you're in the ancient east and you have that information, all you have to do is look at the calendar and start counting off the days. You could estimate roughly when the Messiah would, be, would come, when the Messiah would be born. So that when these magi show up from the east, they're led there by the star, but they're also led there most likely by Daniel's prophecy, by simply doing the math. He says, For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And so when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of all the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Now, here we are some 700 years after Micah writes this prophecy. The Messiah is born. The wise men of the East are led there by the star. And so they get all the religious Jewish scholars together. And Herod wants to know, where is the Messiah going to be born? Their first response is, look, Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what has been written by the prophet. Who are they referring to? Micah, Micah 5. Verse 2, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So what we're saying then is that Bethlehem Ephrathah, this tower of the flock, may indeed have been the very place where Christ was born. Uh, one of the uh, older Jewish historians, Alfred Edersheim, uh, writes this in his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. He says, This Migdal Eater, or the Tower of the Flock, was not the watchtower for ordinary flocks. A passage in the Mishnah, again the book of Jewish oral tradition, leads to the conclusion that the flocks which pastured there were destined for temporal sacrifices, and accordingly that the shepherds who watched over them were not ordinary shepherds, possibly Levitical priests. The same Mishnic passage also leads us to infer that these flocks lay out all year round since they were spoken of as in the field 30 days before the Passover. Thus, Jewish tradition in some dim manner apprehended the first revelation of the Messiah from Migdal Eder, where shepherds watched the temple flocks all the year round. I mean, think about the significance there. You have these lambs who would ultimately be sacrificed. And then here you have Christ 
who if he was born at the tower and then if placed in a manger in swaddling clothes becomes the Lamb of God who ultimately takes away the sins of the world. Mark Bailey notes, what is fascinating is that the angels only told the shepherds that they would find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. That's all the information they had. Evidently, there was no need for the angel to give the shepherds directions. They knew exactly where to go as Luke chapter 2 indicated. And so the shepherds were told Jesus' birthplace and dress, that is how they would find the baby, would be a sign for them. He says, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Uh, the word for swaddling clothes in the Greek uh, language, basically what happens is that sacrificial lambs were wrapped in swaddling clothes to prevent injury or blemish. So when a lamb was born, they would wrap the lamb up in the swaddling clothes so that the lamb would not injure itself. Uh, Dr. Jimmy DeYoung notes this in uh, his article. He says, It was in the lower portion of this watchtower that the birthing of the lambs would take place. The shepherds would wrap the newborn lambs in swaddling clothes to protect the body of the lambs, which would be offered as a sacrifice at the temple just four miles away in Jerusalem. Another commentator notes, Jesus... That is, he was born in the very birthplace where tens of thousands of lambs which had been sacrificed to prefigure him. God promised it, pictured it, and performed it at Migdal Eder, or the Tower of the Flock. So why is this important? Well, it's important because, again, the typology that is involved. As these lambs were birthed and ultimately sacrificed, so Christ was born and ultimately sacrificed as the Lamb of God. And Lamb is one of the many titles that we find being used for Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John and Revelation. For example, on the day that Jesus was going to be baptized, his cousin John the Baptist was out baptizing folks. And John notes, these things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. And the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, that is, John the Baptist looking at Jesus saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But not just John uh, the Baptist, but also the Apostle John notes this from Revelation chapter 5. He's getting a, giving, uh, seeing a vision of heaven and events that are transpiring in the vision of heaven. Then I looked, he notes, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, that's thousands upon thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and on all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. So Jesus, as the Lamb of God, is the fulfillment of two Old Testament types in reference to typology. And that is, he is both suffering servant and the Passover Lamb. Uh, for example, Isaiah, who also, you'll remember, is ministering the same time as Micah, notes this in Isaiah chapter 53, that he was oppressed, speaking of the Messiah. He was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. He also fulfills the typology of the Passover lamb from the book of Exodus. You'll recall from uh, the Exodus events, Moses kept going to Pharaoh saying, let my people go. Of course, Pharaoh didn't let the people go. And so ten plagues followed with the, the angel of da death passing over Egypt, taking the life of all of the firstborn who did not have the sign above their doorpost. And so what happened then, 
is it on the, the date of the Passover lamb, uh, the instructions were given over in Exodus 12 to set apart the 10th day of the first month for the selection of what would be the Passover. In reference to Christ, the, the term or selected or chosen uh, occurs before the foundation of the world. The Passover lamb had to be without spot, spot or blemish. The same thing is recorded of Jesus in 1 Peter 1.19, that he was without spot and blemish. The Passover lamb was killed on the 14th day at evening. Christ was crucified on that 14th day. The blood saved the firstborn of the Hebrews in terms of the Passover lamb. In reference to Christ, by his dying, his blood saves all believers, that is, all who place their faith and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And the Passover lamb, its blood on the doorpost created a separation between good and evil. In reference to Christ, his blood, we are saved, which separates us from the world. And then finally, in reference to the Passover lamb, it foreshadowed a better sacrifice in reference to Christ. His once and for all sacrifice was perfect for all time. So what does it mean? It means that Jesus was the perfect lamb of God whose sacrifice saved those who trusted in him, not only in his death, but also by his birth. So, that brings us to verse 3 and 4. As Micah speaks of that first advent of Christ, which would ultimately end in the death, burial, and resurrection, he also looks ahead to a future time. The second advent of Christ, and we see that in verses 3 and 4. Micah looks ahead to Christ's second advent when Israel will be regathered and justice will reign over the world. Look at verse 3. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. And then at last, his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land. And he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world. What does this mean? Uh, Dr. Earl Radmacher in his commentator notes this. He said the future of Israel then is pictured here in terms of the birth, life, and ministry of the Savior King. The two advents of the Savior are seen as one event by Micah, separated by at least 2,000 years between the first and second advents. Whereas verse 2 speaks about the birth of the Savior and His first coming, uh, verses 3 through 5 speak about the time of the rule of Jesus and the second coming. This minority, that is this remnant of Israel, will never be forgotten by the Lord. And they will ultimately be saved, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, and all Israel will be saved. How then should we live in light of these messianic prophecies? I mean, we're looking at this ultimately, and it's great stuff. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at this, this prophecy which happened 700 years before the first advent of Christ, and we can go back, and it reaffirms our, our trust in the veracity of Scripture. And it does do that. But we also need to remember that there are certain principles uh, that are uh, for us today in reference to can we trust this word. And what we need to understand is that God has an end game. God has an end game for preparing this world for the reign of Christ. And we know, having studied Revelation already, that each time a seal is broken, it unleashes a judgment here upon the earth. And these judgments are horrible things in terms of looking at it from a human perspective. But we must ultimately remember that it is Christ who is unsealing each of these judgments. Why? Because He must prepare the earth for His coming. And that's what He's doing by issuing out these judgments. And so some of the things that we know in reference to the future about these judgments is given to us in prophecy, but still there is a lot of it that we don't know. And for us, 
Sometimes this is where the conflict comes in. Yes, we have the meta narrative of Scripture. We understand the big picture. We know Christ is going to return. We know there's going to be a time of judgment. But we don't know things like the details. There are some Christian ministries who will take the paper in one hand and a Bible in the other and try to find one-to-one correspondence between what's going on out there and trying to somehow make it fit in the Scriptures. Uh, That's not only poor uh, exegesis in terms of trying to Uh, understand the Bible, but it really has to do more with sensationalism and also makes people prone for deception if every time you see something happening out there, you take that as a sign from God. There's no no ultimate way to affirm that. And so again, God has an end game. He knows what it is. The thing we need to keep in mind is that God's ultimate plan in reference to this, certainly we do know some things, And this is God's plan. However, He doesn't hold me or you accountable for the big picture. He doesn't hold me or you accountable for the big picture. What He holds us accountable for are the precepts and commands that He reveals to us in the biblical text and for us not to be presumptuous about what God may do. You hear that all the time, not only in in prophecy here, but uh, sometimes... uh, For those of you who may not know, I sometimes uh, teach at Bible colleges and so on and uh, deal with some uh, friends uh, who have uh, so-called discernment ministries and that kind of thing. And uh, one of the the gentlemen I've been talking to recently, Dr. Uh, Leighton Flowers, uh, which, you know, he's on YouTube and he's always talking against Calvinism and all these other things. Um, And it's like sometimes you'll, you'll hear folks Uh, who were making arguments against that, saying, well, you know, if God's worked out everything that happens, then why should we even go out and evangelize and those kinds of things? Don't you understand that when to make a statement like that is to be presumptuous about what God is going to do? Because you see, God has not only ordained the ends of things, He's also ordained the means to accomplish the ends, and that includes our willingness to evangelize. In other words, our evangelizing our neighbors and ministering to the neighbors is God's means for how He will accomplish the program. So to not do it is to be presumptuous. We see this sometimes even in our own eschatology. Well, you know, the United States is not mentioned in Bible prophecy, so I'm not going to vote and just let the, you know, things happen as is. We can't do that either. Why? That's being presumptuous about God's ultimate plan. You see, nowhere in Scripture, from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, are we told to try to figure out what God's uh, elective counsel and purposes are in terms of you know either flipping a coin or, or trying to look at a crystal ball and so on. Those things are secret. They're, they belong to the secret things of God. And nowhere in the text... Of the older New Testaments, are we, try, are we told or instructed in any sense to figure out what those things are before we do it? What we are told and instructed to do is to live out the precepts and commands that are plainly and clearly revealed in Scripture. And then finally, God expects us to be faithful in those matters and areas of life where we can and do have input. Moreover, we will be accountable for how we live in light of what we know and the opportunities God presents us, regardless of what God is doing in reference to local, national, and world events. In other words, God's got the big picture. But what He wants us to deal with are the moment-by-moment issues of life, things that are coming our way. Did you know that that's what you're going to be held accountable for? Jesus told a parable In Luke chapter 19, he said this. He said, A noble went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave to them ten minas, you could say like a hundred thousand dollars, and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. 
But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that the slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him, so he might know what business they had done. The first appeared and said, Master, your hundred thousand dollars made ten whatever that is. <laughs> and he said to them, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept and put away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you because you were an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I'm an exacting man taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank and having come, I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to the bystanders, take the mine away from him and give it to the one who has ten. And they said to him, master, he has ten minas already. And this is the point of the parable. I tell you that to everyone who has more shall be given, but from the one who does not have even what he has shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. The point is, all of us have something that we can grant and give to the Lord by way of our ministry. Don't squander your opportunities. Utilize the opportunities that God gives you. Now, some of you might be here saying, well, uh, I'm not quite sure where I really am in this whole thing. I mean, you're over here talking about a, a kingdom and a coming kingdom, and, and I've not really heard things like that before. I'm not even sure if I'm in the kingdom. There was a man who had a dream one night where in his dream... He saw the gates of heaven with a mighty angel standing next to the gate. There were three men in line. The first man approached the gates, and the mighty angel said, What is the password, and why should I let you into heaven? And the first man said, Works. Good works. That's the password. And I've been a person who tries to do as best I can with whatever circumstance I find myself. I'm better than my neighbors. I'm better than my co-workers. I don't have a criminal record. Good works. And the mighty angel said, depart from this place, you worker of iniquity. The Lord does not know you. And the second man came to the gates. And the angel said, what is the password and why should I let you into heaven? The man said, religion. Religion is the password. And I have mastered religion when I was alive on the earth. I studied about Buddhism and Hinduism. And I studied even about the occult. I studied Satanism. And I know everything there is to know about religion. I'm a religious person. The angel said, no. Depart from here. You worker of lawlessness, the Lord does not know you. Finally, the man in the dream said the third man walked up with his head down. And the mighty angel said, what is the password and why should I let you into heaven? And the man was looking down at the ground said, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That is the password. And the angel said, why should I let you in? He said, because... Nothing to this gate I bring, simply to His cross I cling. No works, no religion, not e'er one toll, but in Christ alone to save my soul. That's what I'm trusting in. Amen. And the angel stepped aside and said, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom of God prepared from you from the foundation of the world. So if that describes you this morning and you have not in the past known a salvific relationship with Christ by simply trusting that is believing in Him 
for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, you belong to the kingdom. You're placed into the kingdom so that when Christ comes, you'll not only be there, but being a co-heir, you'll have it all. And that is Micah 5, verses 1 through 4.